Hi, I'm Celia Starr, and I teach art history at the University of San Francisco. I'm really excited to be here to discuss Frida Kahlo and her art in anticipation of the exhibition Frida Kahlo Timeless, which opens on June 5th. My book, Frida in America, was published in 2020, and my talk focuses on my personal journey discovering Kahlo and the many unanswered questions that led me to write the book about Kahlo's formative years. I hope this talk will provide a foundation for visitors to the Frida Kahlo Timeless Exhibition with its range of artworks showcasing the breadth and depth of Kahlo's art. If you have questions for me at the end of my talk, please write them in the chat or save them to ask verbally during the Q&A. I'd be happy to answer them. Now, as many of you know, Kahlo, who came of age in the years after the Mexican Revolution, was committed throughout her life to upholding and uplifting the voices and traditions of the indigenous peoples of Mexico. And as I speak to you from the San Francisco Bay Area, I wanna recognize that the San Francisco Bay Area rests upon evidence of indigenous cultures going back at least 15,000 years. I acknowledge that the University of San Francisco sits upon the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples, the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As guests, I recognize that I and the university benefit from living and working on Ohlone traditional territory. And I pay my respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush Ohlone community. Porfirio Diaz looks in the mirror and sees his brown mestizo skin. He picks up a powder puff dusted in white and begins to cover his indigenous Mixtec ancestry. For 31 years, this military general led Mexico masquerading as a light-skinned Spanish man because he wanted to make his country over into a Europe of the new world. By 1910, this ideal that had permeated the social fabric of Mexican society began to unravel with the outbreak of revolution. 20 years later, while in San Francisco, the artist Frida Kahlo looks in the mirror and sees her light brown skin. She's thankful she didn't end up with her father's German complexion, commenting, I remember the color of my father's skin, that I did not like it. She's happy to see her mother's darker skin and powerful deep set eyes accented by her maternal grandmother's conjoined eyebrows. She parts her black hair down the middle and pulls it back into a low bun. She applies lipstick, places Aztec inspired earrings in her earlobes and clasps an Aztec jadeite necklace around her neck. Then over her long peasant style skirt and blouse, she wraps her shoulders with a reposo, that ubiquitous shawl symbolizing Mexican women of all classes. But the way she crosses the shawl over her shoulders creates the look of a soldadera, a revolutionary female soldier who wore bullet-filled bandoliers crossed in front. Sometimes when not in uniform, soldaderas wore their rebosos crossed in front to distinguish themselves as soldiers. They played a crucial role in the revolution and their fame grew as the popular corrido, La Adelita, about a soldadera who fought for Francisco Madero's troops came to symbolize the revolutionary spirit. After the revolution, the name Adelita became synonymous with any woman who fought for her rights. Frida identified with Adelita and the soldaderas. And while at a Mexican restaurant in San Francisco, she belted out the song, La Adelita, proclaiming to her mother, I was a hit. Frida knew how to pose for Imogene Cunningham by arranging her reboso in a similar fashion to the soldaderas and wearing Aztec inspired jewelry that she evoked the persona of the politically engaged Mexican nationalist. For Frida, who was still coming into her own as a 23-year-old woman, that identity was bound up with the image of the strong, independent, and at times, cross-dressing soldaderas. 
Frida would st soon start creating self-portraits that foregrounded her strength as well. This is what struck me the first time I saw self-portrait with Monkey. A fierce warrior with black hair pulled back tightly, showing off a prominent forehead akin to an Aztec warrior and a bird-like unibrow above intense brown eyes. A black spider monkey perched on her shoulder places its paw around this warrior's neck in a protective yet menacing pose that has the potential to strangle her as it clutches a red ribbon that loops around her neck and the monkeys. Yet Frida, the warrior, doesn't look fearful. This woman radiates power. She's proud of her brown skin and jet black eyebrows, as well as her facial hair just above and below her lips. Standing in front of a dense field of dark green leaves, her red hair ribbon and yellow shirt position her as a very different kind of woman in nature, a theme I'd seen previously in art, but which looked different. Frida doesn't stand nude in nature with an ethereal look on her face. She doesn't lie nude out in nature, nor does she have a mask-like face as in Paula Moderson Becker's self-portrait with amber necklace. In some ways, she has the strong gaze and connection to nature of Leonardo's Mona Lisa. But Frida makes her connection to nature even stronger with the integration of the leaves, the monkey, and the warrior. Just look into the eyes of the warrior and the monkey. They are one and the same. They command this painting. Now, at the time I encountered this image, I was an undergraduate college student at San Francisco State University, sitting in one of my first art history classes, and I had never heard of Frida Kahlo. I had just returned from a three and a half month trip to East Africa, and before that, a trip to Mexico. And I was questioning what to do with my life. In that darkened art history lecture hall, when Professor Whitney Chadwick clicked the slide projector to advance to this painting of a fierce woman and her spider monkey, all the cliches you can imagine happened at once. My heart skipped a beat. I couldn't stop staring. I had to know who made this painting. I just couldn't get this image of Frida out of my head. So I wrote my first art history paper on this then little known Mexican painter. Now at that time, Hayden Herrera had recently published her groundbreaking biography and was making rounds on college campuses. I was overjoyed when I saw she was coming to San Francisco State. The more I learned about Frida, the more I wanted to know. I became immersed in my research for this art history paper and in the world of Frida. Just as traveling to East Africa and Mexico had opened me up to new ways of seeing the world, Frida Kahlo's self-portrait with Monkey helped to change my path in life. I decided to study art history in graduate school. Now, as most of you are probably aware, throughout the 1980s and into the 1990s, Frida's popularity grew as more and more people discovered the incredible art and life of this Mexican woman who was a trailblazer in so many ways. She was a radical in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s because she defied gender and racial stereotypes, both in her life and in her paintings. More and more books and articles were written, exhibitions were mounted, movies were made, and the merchandise kept coming. By the end of the 1990s, Frida had become famous, and I had begun to focus on other artists. I never stopped loving Frida's paintings. I just tucked her away while working on my PhD. But Frida wouldn't let go of me. In 2007, now teaching at the University of San Francisco, I had the opportunity to present a paper for a conference that featured women artists working between the two world wars. Now, as I pondered which artists I'd like to focus on, I realized that all the artists I'd ever read about from the interwar period were white Europeans. My interests had always been cross-cultural, so I thought Frida would be a fascinating artist because she was Mexican, yet she was in the United States between 1930 and 1933, a period that was instrumental in her development as an artist and the creation of her persona as a provocateur. Now, certainly scholars had discussed her important breakthrough paintings while in Detroit, such as Henry Ford Hospital and My Birth. But a fuller understanding of her creative process 
which led to these breakthroughs and her complex reactions to what she experienced in San Francisco, Detroit, and New York were missing. We knew a lot about her mature style, but not as much about her development as an artist. How did she get from two women from 1929 to the two Fridas 10 years later in 1939? Or from two women to portrait of Ava Frederick? Or from portrait of Mrs. Jean White to portrait of Luther Burbank created just three months later? Now, Frida's portrait of Jean White is a well-constructed, lovely painting of this woman who with her husband Clifford White lived in the same building as Frida and her husband muralist Diego Rivera. They lived at 716 Montgomery Street. Now with Jean's portrait, Frida combines aspects of a style she'd been working with in Mexico, which was inspired by colonial style paintings um, such as ones that you see in the middle and also retablos, which you see on the far left. These were paintings that were made on tin and they were made by local artisans and sold in the markets. They often have inscriptions, as you can see, giving thanks um, to a saint or sometimes to Jesus as we have here on the left. And it would be giving thanks for saving a loved one from death. Now in Frida's case, the inscription on her portrait of Jean White identifies the sitter, the month and year it was painted, the city where it was painted, and the artist's name. When looking at the center painting by Bustos, we can see how Frida has borrowed elements as well, such as the green curtain, the visible back of the chair, and the strong gaze. But Frida had been working with some of these symbols before she came to San Francisco, as we can see here in her self-portrait, Time Flies, in the center. This self-portrait was made shortly after she married Diego Rivera. And she sets herself up as a woman of the people with her simple white top and Aztec jadeite necklace. The airplane above connects her to the changing modern world just outside her window, something that other Mexican artists had been working with as well, such as what we see here with Best Mogar in his self-portrait. Now, when she made the painting of Jean White, she borrowed then the green curtain with red tie back and the chair from uh, artists like Bustos. Jean therefore becomes a modern woman who sits in an interior setting coming out of Mexican style colonial paintings, but with a San Francisco cityscape behind her. And this was the type of cross-cultural style Frida was working with when she first was in San Francisco. Now she had attempted some self-portraits while in San Francisco, but she really wasn't happy with them. But one that she did like was her self-portrait standing alongside Diego, seen here. In this painting, Frida and Diego Rivera, Frida conveys some important differences between husband and wife. Diego stands tall, his feet firmly planted on the ground with his brushes and palette in hand next to Frida who tilts her head toward her husband as if to convey her deference to the maestro. Now, most authors see the painting as an example of Frida as the wife to a larger than life artist. It's surmised that Frida didn't see herself as an artist at this early stage. But details matter when it comes to Frida's art. In terms of color, Frida's vibrant red rebozo hugging her shoulders and hanging down in front of her green dress really stands out. It catches the eye, drawing our attention to this Mexican woman who we learn from the banner above is the artist who created this painting for Albert Bender, one of the most important art patrons in the Bay Area. It was a smart move on Frida's part as he loaned it to many exhibitions until 1935 when he donated it to the newly created San Francisco Museum of Art known today as F SF MoMA. Now the fact that Frida made this painting for Bender and placed the information in the ribbon above made me think that Frida was more ambitious than most people thought. When I began reading the hundreds of letters that Frida wrote home to family and friends, I discovered that my hunch was correct. Frida was ambitious. She wrote to her mother on December 4th, 1930, less than one month after arriving in San Francisco, quote, 
I am painting because they want me to have an exhibition before we go. It's a good opportunity for me to sell some things and help you more. And if I lose this chance, I will kick myself. Don't you agree? We will probably move to a hotel so I can paint all day instead of spending my time sweeping floors and stupid stuff like that. Now, although Frida and Diego did not move out of the artist flat they shared with other artists at 716 Montgomery Street, a couple of weeks later, Frida told her mother, I'm painting quite a lot, almost all day long. Now, while Frida's marriage portrait may seem to some to be a statement of her subordinate role within her marriage. If we look at an earlier drawing she made when she first arrived in San Francisco and we zero in on the placement of Frida's hand in her painting, the issue of power begins to shift. In the drawing, Frida's hand is submerged under Diego's as if she were his child. In the painting, Frida's hand is on top. She has more control. This hand gesture in conjunction with her choice of colors, words in the banner, and clothing and jewelry are significant. Now certainly, once again, she's referencing Mexican art, particularly uh, 19th century portrait painter, Jose Maria Estrada. But I wanted to know more about Frida's creative development while living in San Francisco. I read that she had turned heads while walking down the street, wearing her beautiful, colorful outfits, like the one seen here. But that didn't tell me anything about the impact San Francisco had on her. What I discovered was that Frida's independent spirit was championed by her fellow female artist, Lucille Blanche, who lived downstairs from Frida, and Pele de Lop, a young art student at the California School of Fine Arts, known today as the San Francisco Art Institute. They would gather together in Lucille's studio and create drawings, either separately or together. Sometimes they pass around a piece of paper and make a composite drawing. Other times they choose a theme like maternity and each would draw their own version, as we can see in Pele's drawing down here, where she says we're looking at, quote, a voluptuous woman with flowing red hair and five breasts nursing five babies of different races, end quote. Now, whatever they drew, it was typically bucking societal norms, or it often had a, quote, witty, wicked touch, according to Pele. Now, for Frida, this meant including blood, saying in English one night, let's draw the bloodiest thing we can think of. I realized that these nights of creative experimentation led to one of Frida's first major breakthroughs in style. So the balanced and lovely cross-cultural portraits Frida had been creating in San Francisco, like the one of Jean, suddenly changed in style with portrait of Luther Burbank, a well-known botanist and horticulturist who became famous for his hybrid fruits, vegetables, flowers, and trees. Luther's life's work clearly inspired Frida to deviate from her style and create the man as a hybrid, part human, part tree. Gone are the obvious symbols of Mexican colonial paintings and retablos, such as the curtain, wooden chair back, and banner or scroll with an inscription. But Mexican and Aztec notions of the interconnectedness of life and death inform this innovative painting. And she's incorporated blood. Now, Frida and Diego visited Burbank's house in Santa Rosa, California. And while Luther had died in 1926, his widow Elizabeth still lived in the house. They had the opportunity to see and experience Luther's beloved gardens, including the huge cedar of Lebanon tree seen on the left. Luther was buried under it and Frida places Luther's skeleton under the ground and with blood still coursing through it, it nourishes the roots of the tree which sustains the man tree above. Now Luther's life's work and his burial place obviously inspired Frida, but again, the idea to create a hybrid man tree would have seemed natural due to images of Aztec hybrid human plant deities or day of the dead skeletons with trees, flowers, and cacti growing from the bones of the skeleton. Now clearly living in San Francisco and visiting Burbank's home in Santa Rosa had a big impact on Frida as a person and an artist. She was painting a lot. She was thinking about having an exhibition. Yet most would say that Frida disliked the United States 
or what she called Gringolandia. And this is true, but it's too simplistic. Yes, she disliked aspects of the United States, hated the injustices she witnessed, but she also found San Francisco to be a beautiful city surrounded by water. She marveled at Chinatown. She loved the Metropolitan Museum in New York, got a kick out of American movies and actresses such as Mae West or actors such as Charlie Chaplin. I wanted to know more fully what Frida disliked and what she liked. What had the most impact either in a positive or a negative manner? Now, when discussing Frida's time in the US, understandably, scholars tend to focus on these two breakthrough paintings because they foreground Frida's physical and emotional pain, a subject that's emphasized in the literature on the artist. And yes, Detroit is the place where Frida had a, a, a physical and emotional, went through a physical and emotional trauma due to a miscarriage. And we can see that trauma on her face in the drawing on the left or in the, the tears on the right in the lithograph that she made of Frida and the miscarriage. But this is also the place where she apparently gained a third eye seen on her hospital gown here in the drawing. And this third eye allowed her, it seems, to possess per perception beyond ordinary sight. So if Frida's 1929 marriage license listed her as a housewife, then her Detroit library card three and a half years later reveals her changed status, artist. And look at how Frida holds the heart-shaped palette. She holds it now instead of Diego. And she sprouted a third arm. So these works of art are certainly very important to Frida's breakthrough. Uh, Frida and the miscarriage and also my, um, my birth and Henry Ford Hospital. But Frida also made two of her most politically charged paintings while in the United States, such as self-portrait on the borderline between Mexico and the United States created in Detroit, and my dress hangs there created in New York. Now, both of these paintings are filled with images that are difficult to decipher in a reproduction. There were many objects I noticed though, once I got to see the paintings in person in 2008, when I went to an exhibition at SF MoMA. So for example, in my dress hangs there, in reproductions, I'd certainly seen the collaged images in the foreground that Frida took from newspaper clippings. And I had read about the context of the economic depression with people in breadlines and protesting. But when I saw the painting in person, there were three signs that jumped out at me. And you can make them out here and here in the foreground of the painting. One says smash Scottsboro frame up. Another says Negro white. And a third says Negro and white dressmaker on the picket lines. I wanted to know why Frida had included these signs. They were taken from newspapers. So she was making a choice as to which photos to cut out and collage into her painting. The reference to a dressmaker on the picket lines takes on significant when you realize that Frida has placed her dress front and center. In fact, many of the protesters walk underneath her dress as if the dress is watching over them. What's also significant is there's an emphasis on black and white workers united in their call for better wages, job security, and racial justice. I wondered if Frida had experienced any of the protests in the streets of New York in 1933. Did she have direct experience? Or was she an observer who had only experienced them by reading the newspaper? I began to do some research into this period of the early 1930s, and I learned that the Communist Party of the United States was promoting unity between black and white workers. Under the party's legal arm called the International Labor Defense, they hired New York criminal defense attorney Samuel Leibowitz for the appeals of nine African-American youths referred to as the Scottsboro Boys. These nine youths, ranging in age from 19 to 12, had been unjustly accused of raping two white women on a freight train in Alabama toward the end of March, 1931. 
At their first trial, it was a hung jury, but Judge Hawkins declared a mistrial and sentenced eight of the nine to the electric chair. In January of 1933, when the first appeals case for Haywood Patterson commenced, his chances of being found innocent were promising. Yet in April of 1933, once again, an all white jury found Patterson guilty, sentencing him to death. On April 9th, an outraged public took to the streets in Harlem, and then again on April 25th, and on May Day in New York City's Union Square, and in Washington, D.C. on May 8th, 1933, led by Hayward Patterson's mother, Janie Patterson, seen here. Tensions were so high that the judge presiding over the remaining cases of the Scottsboro Boys were postponed. I soon realized that the high profile Scottsboro case combined with the Communist Party's sponsorship of legal services and marches that were designed to help free these African-American youths was an important part of Frida's experience while in the United States. She and Diego even gave money to help with the legal fees for these appeals cases. I learned that she not only would have known about the call for racial and class justice through the newspapers, but that she and Diego were caught up in the energy of protest. Diego had begun working on his mural for the new RCA building in Rockefeller Plaza on April 2nd. Frida wrote on the back of her painting, My Dress Hangs There, that she made it while Diego was painting his Man at the Crossroads mural at Rockefeller Plaza. Both were creating during this tense time and both include images of protest and images of black men. In Diego's mural on the left, he shows workers carrying protest signs. On the right, he emphasizes justice for all with a soldier, a white worker, Vladimir Lenin and a black male worker holding hands, seen better here in this close-up. Diego took the black man reviled in American society and made him a figure of unity in the communist Soviet Union. It would not be long before Diego's inclusion of Lenin, a Russian communist revolutionary and theorist would be cause for a controversy. On May 4th, Nelson Rockefeller asked Diego to remove Lenin's face from the mural and Diego refused. Ultimately, Diego was paid in full, but was asked to leave on May 9th. And the mural, which was close to completion, was ultimately destroyed. This prompted protests in New York City, seen here. But before the May 17th protests of the firing of Diego by the Rockefellers, the Nazi book burnings occurred on May 10th. In 34 towns, university students throughout Germany threw their books by authors such as Brecht, Hemingway, and Helen Keller into fire pits to, quote, cleanse the German spirit. End quote. The American Jewish Congress had coordinated in advance huge nationwide demonstrations. A crowd estimated at 80 to 100,000 marched through the New York City streets for approximately six hours. You could say that New York City in 1933 was consumed with protest marches. Protesting the huge wealth gap in a capitalist system made more prominent by the economic depression protesting the inequities of a racist legal system that guaranteed a black man would be sentenced to death for being accused of raping a white woman, protesting the rise of Nazism with its anti-Semitic government policies and intensive propaganda pro program, protesting the suppression of the freedom of expression. After having a fuller understanding of this history, the newspaper clippings of marches collaged in the foreground of Frida's painting became much more than a generalized sign of the times. They made me feel the anguish, pain, frustration, and fear in this tumultuous period, as well as the elation of unity in the face of grave dangers and dire outcomes. In Frida's painting, Lady Liberty stands in the background, her arm and torch held high, with independent Mae West in the left middle ground, and Frida's Taiwan dress hanging in the center foreground, hovering above the protesters. Perhaps Frida is saying that it's time for women to have real political and economic power. Frida's political painting and Diego's political mural were not isolated works of art that expressed such social and political issues. 
Frida was surrounded by artists who were galvanized by the Scottsboro legal battle that went on for years, such as Hideo Noda's gouache, Scottsboro Boys, or Isamu Noguchi's sculpture, Death. These works would have resonated with her because Frida had seen the Jim Crow system of segregation firsthand when a year before she painted My Dress Hangs There, she stopped in Little Rock, Arkansas with her friend and fellow artist, Lucienne Block. As the two were walking through the train station, they saw a sign that stated for Negroes, indicating the separate area for boarding. Now, according to Block's granddaughter, Lucienne Allen, quote, Frida insisted my grandmother take this picture of her because they were both angered by such blatant racism, end quote. In Lucien Block's journal, she wrote of this experience. It is like being in another world to see such outrageous medievalism. Now in 2008, this was a photograph I'd never seen before and I'd never read anything about it but it became one of several threads I pulled together to better understand Frida's experiences with racism while in the United States and her use of protest imagery seen in my dress hangs there or her beautiful depiction of an African-American woman with an active gaze as seen here in her portrait of Ava Frederick. Nothing of substance had been written about this portrait. I had my work cut out for me. I also wanted to know more about self-portrait on the borderline between Mexico and the United States, created in 1932, while Frida was in Detroit. It became the focal point of my talk at that conference on women artists working between the two world wars. Like my dress hangs there, it's a complex painting with a lot to absorb. Images on the right represent the United States with images on the left representing Mexico. But in the middle on a border marker stands Frida with perfect posture. She wears a colonial style floor length pastel pink dress with fitted bodice. While it's easy to get lost in all the images in this painting, once again, details matter. This proper looking young woman becomes a provocateur when you notice her tight fitting bodice and visible nipples. Her obvious brawlessness would have raised eyebrows among the Detroit area's upper crust but Frida doesn't look ashamed. She stands tall as an independent Mexican woman symbolized by the lit cigarette in one hand and the paper Mexican flag in the other. She also stands tall as a mestiza, a woman of mixed ethnicities wearing a colonial style dress and a beaded necklace bearing the colors of the Mexican flag. It's a hybrid outfit and it's appropriate as scholar Gloria Anzaldúa observes. The Mexico-United States border is a site where many different cultures touch each other and the permeable, flexible, and ambiguous shifting grounds lend themselves to hybrid images, end quote. Frida plays up her hybridity through her outfit and through her connection to both sides of the border. She also plays up her strong gaze, something she'd been perfecting as an adolescent seen here on the left in this family photograph. Now she continues to perfect her piercing gaze seen in her self-portrait with necklace in the center created in the United States and then further intensified in her portrait self-portrait from 1940. Now in 2007, I had many unanswered questions about this 1932 painting, both in terms of symbolism and the context in which Frida created it. What was Frida's experience of the US-Mexico -Mexico border when she crossed over by train in 1932, especially given the anti-Mexican feeling and the forced deportation of approximately 1.8 million in the 1930s? Now, fortunately, I had the journal of Frida's traveling companion and fellow artist, Lucienne Block, to help answer some questions. But I also wanted to know why Frida placed the American flag in the smoke of Ford industry? What did she think of Henry Ford and his River Rouge plant? What was happening with Ford workers around the time she was making this painting? I found out, for example, that on New Year's Day, 1933, Ford cut employees' wages for the second time in three years, prompting 9,000 workers to go on strike. 
A little over a month later, a reproduction of Frida's painting was shown in the February Detroit News article, Wife of Master Mural Painter Gleefully Dabbles in Works of Art. Now, while journalist Florence Davies belittles Frida's talent as an artist with her choice of words, gleefully dabbles in the title, she conceded in the article that Frida's painting is by no means a joke, end quote. Now, in 2008, I continued working on my analysis of self-portrait on the borderline between Mexico and the United States for another symposium. This time, the symposium accompanied the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art's 2008 Frida Kahlo exhibition. The theme of the symposium, an idea that Whitney Chadwick and I proposed, was to focus on the three US cities of San Francisco, Detroit, and New York. Whitney Chadwick discussed Frida in San Francisco, I discussed Frida in Detroit, and Hayden Herrera discussed Frida in New York. I felt as if I had come full circle from my early days of discovering Frida due to both Whitney Chadwick and Hayden Herrera. It was one of the high points of my career. I was also thrilled to meet and speak with art historian Victor Zamudio Taylor, artist Amalia Mesa Baines, and curator scholar Terry Romero. They had been symposium respondents and the conversations with all three, both on stage and in private, made me realize that many of the questions I had about Frida's artistic sources and her creative development, both before coming to the United States and while she was in the United States, didn't have clear answers or any at all. I needed to conduct a lot more research. Now, in the weeks after the symposium at SF MoMA, a feeling grew inside of me that I needed to write the book I wanted to read. I envisioned a book for a general audience detailing Frida's personal and creative journey while living in the United States from 1930 to 1933. I wanted to write a story, not a scholarly essay or book, but a story that would be well-researched and factual, yet written in a style that would allow readers to feel as if they were on this journey with Frida. As the documentary filmmaker Ken Burns puts it, history is mostly story, end quote. For it is the great storytelling tradition found in most cultures and time periods that allows us to understand complex information in a manner that sticks because we feel something. Perhaps writer Maya Angelou says it best. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel. My hope is that this cross-cultural journey will inspire people to think about Frida in new and profound ways, to understand her more fully as a complex, brilliant woman who in her early 20s struggled to find her own voice as an artist and person, but who ultimately broke through to a signature style that she would build upon for the rest of her career. Now, I believe Frida had everything inside of her that she needed to produce a major breakthrough in her art before coming to the United States. However, experiencing both her own personal turmoil and the United States' political and social turmoil created a combustible energy that produced artworks such as Portrait of Luther Burbank, Henry Ford Hospital, My Birth, Frida and the Miscarriage, Self-Portrait on the Borderline, and my dress hangs there. As one of Frida's favorite authors, D.H. Lawrence said, quote, all art partakes of the spirit of place in which it is produced, end quote. Now this place happened to be the United States. And so the word America in the title of my book references Frida's time in the United States of America. But because this is a story about a Mexican artist, it's an America seen through Frida's eyes. She brings a very different and complicated perspective to what we call in this country, the American experience. For her, America is both the United States and Latin America. It is the problematic North American border relationship between Mexico and the United States. And it is the promise of Pan-Americanism, which was taken up by artists, intellectuals, and social activists in the 1930s, including Frida's husband, Diego Rivera. Now Frida is an icon today, but in her role as a beloved icon, as scholar Margaret Lindauer has observed, 
Kahlo became synonymous with a look rather than with her creative production, end quote. That is, Frida's look is more well known than the contents and interpretations of her paintings. And so to this end, in tracing her creative process, I wanted to look closely at the paintings. I thought it would be incredible if I could somehow discuss the paintings in a way that allowed readers to step into them as if they were rooms. Instead of looking at a work of art from a distance as one might in a gallery or museum, I thought if I could create a greater intimacy between Frida's paintings and readers, then people might gain a deeper understanding of her creative process and the multiple layers of her often profound works of art. Likewise, in the epilogue, I wanted to give a sense of how the new breakthrough paintings created in the United States affected her later work how her laying bare of the physical and emotional pain she endured in Henry Ford Hospital was later expressed in Remembrance of an Open Wound or the Broken Column. Or how the use of blood and red strings were first used in her paintings in the United States, but these two symbols as well as the heart became more prevalent in her work after she returned to Mexico in 1933. And to this end, I wrote the prologue to emphasize the significance of blood, the heart, Aztec traditions um, for Frida. And so I would like to end my talk by reading my prologue. The prologue begins with a quote from an Aztec myth. The Aztec sun god Huitzilopochtli threw a rebel's heart into Lake Texcoco and proclaimed when you see an eagle perched on a cactus holding a snake in its mouth, this is where you shall build your city. Frida was lying in a blood-soaked bed. Small creases in the white cotton sheets had absorbed the red liquid like the fruit of a prickly pear cactus sliced open. Glistening magenta, fruit of the earth, the blood miracle that consecrated the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan now surrounded Frida's naked body with the pain of death. The eagle and snake were missing in the dark early morning hours, but the sun still came up, casting light on Frida's dark, damp hair covered with salty tears. She wailed in agony and despair. Diego, frantic, didn't know what to do. The blood, the screaming, it was all too much for him. He rushed into the living room muttering something about the doctor. A call was made, but Frida would have to suffer for another hour before an ambulance arrived. At the Henry Ford Hospital, Frida, recumbent on a gurney, was whisked through a long, narrow cement hallway in the basement. Her eyes fixed on what she perceived to be multicolored pipes on the ceiling. Look, Diego, que precioso, how beautiful, she exclaimed. This was the last bit of beauty Frida would encounter for a while. We descend from death, Carlos Fuentes sings out. Death smiles, dances, and provides the sweet caresses of a lover. The skeletons of Jose Guadalupe Posada fill the imagination, especially during Day of the Dead celebrations, embracing Mexicans with their origins, holding on to Aztec times. The past is always present, Fuentes whispers. The heart, center of the human body, is the axis mundi. Keep the universe in motion, the Aztecs proclaimed. Feed the gods. Blood was the cuisine the gods favored. Blood creates a line from the earthly to the divine, from death to life, from darkness to light. The duality of life for the Aztecs, as for Frida, was a bringing together of opposites. Everything is all in one, Frida wrote. Seating these opposites side by side to share the blood of death and life, she painstakingly stitched them together with paint, one small stroke at a time. Blood and the concept of duality became central for Frida's art and life while living in the United States. She was a child of the Mexican Revolution, as she liked to say, a passionate defender of the underdog. But it took living in the United States, a place she longed to visit since her teenage years, to shake her foundations of home and homeland, forcing her to see a different reality. She struggled and stumbled in this foreign country, cursing it at times, embracing it at others. 
but always she visualized it with a keen eye for the humor that bubbled under the surface of pain. Frida loved life. It came through in her infectious throaty laugh and in her direct manner of speaking. Even in English, sometimes she'd exaggerate her Mexican accent when necessary to spice up the conversation or punctuate a point. It came through in her way of dressing, whether she wears, was wearing a man's suit or a colorful peasant style pleated skirt and top, details mattered. The right Aztec inspired earrings, the perfect length cane, the precise size of jadeite beads, the best shade of lipstick. Everything was done with love. Love is the only reason for living, she proclaimed. Fuente said Frida was a quote, natural pantheist, a woman and an artist involved in the glory of universal celebration, an explorer of the interrelatedness of all things, a priestess declaring everything created as sacred, end quote. When she came to the United States at 23 with her husband, muralist Diego Rivera, she was still at the beginning of this exploration with eyes wide open, seeing how all things were interrelated and integrating this universal celebration into her art. The young Frida was a novice painter, her husband, on the other hand, was 44 and at the height of his creative powers. When Time Magazine ran a short article on Diego a year into his stay in the United States, it referred to Frida as, quote, his pretty little Mexican wife, the former Frida Kahlo, end quote. Frida would always be physically petite, but her identity as Frida Kahlo, the great painter, grew in stature as she grew creatively and personally in the United States. Her first stop was San Francisco, a place she dreamt about for years. The day before Diego received the letter from the American architect, Timothy Pfluger, inviting him to paint a mural on the wall of his recently completed Pacific Stock Exchange mural in San Francisco, ex Stock Exchange building in San Francisco, Frida had her recurring dream. She saw herself waving goodbye to her family as she left her beloved Mexican homeland for San Francisco the city of the world, as she called it. It amazed Diego that Frida's dream had been so prescient. Frida knew she had to start packing because she believed you had to protect what destiny has given you. Thank you.